Heavenly Father, we thank you again for, for this class and the time you've given us and ask again just for, for the gift of understanding and clarity and, and just seeing your plan as you've laid it out before us. And thank you for the, the revelation that you have given us and that you have included us in, in, the, in the mystery um, of your plan for the ages. So Father, just open this book and open these words to our minds and our hearts and let us glean from them what we need to have to be better equipped to do the work you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we are uh, we're kind of rounding Ben here and we are getting uh, very close to the end next week. This will be our last week. <coughs> and so we are... Um, <coughs> uh, I passed out this year. You know, again, it, it may be more confusing for you, and I apologize for that. <coughs> if it is, you can get rid of it. <laughs> um, but what Larkin has done here is he sort of compared Daniel to Revelation. So you can see the, um, the image that, that Daniel um, made, and you know, his, his image of uh, <coughs> gold and silver and uh, bronze and iron and, and the, you know, the clay and the ten toes and all that. And you can see how the ten toes sort of span across the, the, uh, the church age because it's looking at the Roman Empire and sort of the crumbling of the Roman Empire and <clears throat> some of the things that we talked about. Um, and so you can sort of see uh, some of the overlap and sort of the point of really studying these two books together. So we are um, going to be picking up in chapter 10. And this is kind of when things are really going to start getting interesting. <clears throat> you know, we've been through the um, the seals and the trumpets and all the curses and the things that are going to be happening therein. <clears throat> and we talked about how, um, again, however somebody wants to look at this, because there's certain, certainly um, validity to looking at the, the seals and the trumpets and the bowls as being consecutive. Um, and we talked about this last week at how um, you know I see the seals as going to the from the beginning to the end of the tribulation. I see the trumpets. I'll be picking up somewhere in the first half. <coughs> And then I see the, the bowls really, in my opinion, the bowls kind of pick up right about that three and a half year period. <coughs> um, so it's sort of, they're concurrent, but they're sort of staggered in my opinion, the way they, because, that, and that's why sometimes when you look at them, they look like they're consecutive, because it's, you know, you look at the bowls, and there's, there's nothing in the bowls that looks like it could be in the first half of the, of the of the, uh, the tribulation. It's just all bad. It's all just tragic. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's fairly understood that this all takes place in the second half, but there are aspects of the seals that, in my opinion, go all the way to the return of Christ. So, um, so I think that this is a lot of overlap as it sort of goes on. And again, this is just a very Hebraic way of telling a story, and <clears throat> it makes it hard for us sometimes, and we're going to see a lot of that Tonight and next week, this what I call these parenthetical um, gaps, where we're sort of going along, we're chugging along. E even if you're using this, this sort of a chronological, even though we're going chronologically and then backing up and then going chronologically, <clears throat> there are times when we sort of go, we're, we're chugging along and then we go, well, wait a minute, we're going to break completely from the chronology and do something completely different for a while. Maybe we're going to go back in time. Maybe we're even going to go forward in time. <clears throat> Maybe we're just going to go somewhere else. Maybe we're going to go to heaven and do something that has nothing to do with the chronology. And we're going to talk about some things. And then they sort of pick up again where they left off. <clears throat> so, again, as, as, as funny as this may sound, that's, it's a very Hebraic way, a very Hebrew way of doing things. That's just, you know, um, how that... Eastern mind works even in their language, like I shared last week. <clears throat> the time and sequence 
are somewhat irrelevant to, um, to things. It's more about, and that's why we see things in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, there's more of an emphasis on how they say things than on when things happen. Even to the extent of like, <clears throat> when they want to emphasize something, they just say the word twice. You know, they don't have words like really, or very, or things like that, you know, or, or something to, they don't have exclamation points and things. If they want to emphasize things, they just say it twice. <clears throat> That's just their way of doing it. Had you ever heard uh, Rick about saying something three times and the only word that's ever said three times is the word holy, holy, holy? Uh, it's, it's not the only thing. Because um, in, in Hebrews, when it says, um, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he takes that from Deuteronomy, where, where God says that, and he says, I will never, no, never, no, never. He says it three times. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are there in, in, in the sort of the theological realm, it's, it's called the triple superlative. You know, where <clears throat> they, there, is, there are certain things, like holy, 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 that typically is a reference to the Trinity. Holy, 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 because God is triune. But um, just that, that kind of language is very typical in the Hebrew language. They want to emphasize something. If they want to say, I really, 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 you know, we might say that. We might say, I really, 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 or when we say things like, I know that I know that I know, and we're trying to emphasize things, that's kind of the thing that they do. They will say things three times. Like when God says, I will never, no, never, no, never leave you nor forsake you. <clears throat> so, and even like, we'll see it tonight, the word forever and ever is the word age to age. It's the same word twice. So it's just, it's, it's an emphasis that not just forever, but forever and ever. So it's an emphasis to the, to the length of time. <clears throat> so, we are sort of in, you know, we've, had, we've heard the sixth trumpet, and the book of Revelation is going to play that game again with us, just like they did with the sixth seal, where we had the sixth seal, and then we sort of took a break for a while and did something else before we came back with the seventh seal. Well, this is what's happening here. We're going to take what we took, that we listened to the, um, the sixth trumpet, uh, which were the angels of the, Euph the Euphrates, and now we're going to take a break from that, and... Um, we see this scene where, where John sees a mighty angel. <clears throat> um, this is an angel. People want to say, oh, is this Jesus? Is this, you know, so it's a description of the angel. His feet were like pillars of fire and rainbows on his head and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, but we actually see later on um, in verse 6 that the angel swore by him who lives forever and ever. Well, he's swearing by him who lives forever and ever, then he's not the one who lives forever and ever. So he can't be Jesus Christ, so he must be an angel of some kind. <clears throat> um, and uh, this is kind of a brief chapter. Um, he just, he comes down, he's got a book. The word, the word is, it's, it's, um, the word for book is Biblia, just like the Bible, right? It's Biblia. The word for the scroll, where they had the seven seals, is Biblia which is like a small book. Well, this is, um, the word is bibliaridon, which means a really small book. <laughs> a little bitty book. So, and we don't know what it is. We never find out really what's in it. <clears throat> um, but it says this, this angel comes down, and it says he sets one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. And most um, scholars believe that's just representing the, the, the totality of his dominion, okay, <clears throat> that, um, or his authority, that he is both on land and on sea, you know, everything on the earth is either on land or on sea, so it sort of it talks about his, his authority or his dominion <clears throat> on the earth. And then we've got an interesting phenomenon here, you know, we've got these seven thunders, um, but when John says, well, I, know, well, I was about to write down what the seven thunders said. So the seven thunders was actually somebody saying something. And it was probably God, because <clears throat> very often in the scriptures when it speaks in the voice of God, it talks about it being like thunder. So John apparently understood what was being said, because he was about to write down what the seven thunders said. 
and then was told, no, seal up the things which the seven th the thunders uttered, and do not write them. And, you know, that's almost, that's almost more frustrating than, than not telling us, is telling us that he heard it and he understood it, but that he can't tell us. Um, you know, and it, it, you almost, it makes you wonder, well, why even put it in there? Why, why say, it's like somebody coming up and saying, I've got, I've got something, boy, you want to know. What is it? Well, I can't tell you. I wish you had just not even told me that you knew, you know. <clears throat> why is it in there? Well, there, it's there to let us know that this is not the entire story. That there are things that we don't know, and God decides what we need to know and what we don't need to know. It's what I often tell people <clears throat> regarding the scripture. You know, this Bible is the Word of God to my life. It is everything that God wants me to know. It is God's mind for me. It is not the entirety of God's mind. The entirety of it is God's mind, but you can't fit the entirety of God's mind in my hand. <laughs> that would be pretty pathetic. Um, and, you know, even as limited as that is, it's still beyond our comprehension in ways that we'll never know. We'll, we'll know someday, <clears throat> but we'll never know here on earth. There are things that are true of God and things about God that are not contained in the Scriptures. And uh, we'll, we'll find out about these things when we get there. So, you know, this is just an opportunity of, for God to let us know that Look, you're, you're getting a look into, into a lot of things that are happening, but it's not everything. And there are some things that I'm going to hold on to. You know, because it's, it's, it's just not something that you need to know. And, um, and he's God. He's sovereign. So, <clears throat> um, and he talks about this uh, mystery. He says, but in the days of the signing of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants and the prophets. And I just want to take a second to talk about this word mystery, because the word mystery occurs many times in the New Testament, talking about the, uh, the gospel sometimes being a mystery. <clears throat> um, and the grace of God, the revelation of the grace of God being a mystery. Our idea of a mystery is a different um, concept than what the Greek language idea of a mystery is. Our idea of a mystery is something we don't know. If we're watching a mystery movie, we don't know how it's going to end. Right? There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a knowledge gap where we don't know. That's our idea of a mystery. Well, a mystery in the Greek language, mysterion is the word, means something that could not be known unless it was specifically revealed. It could be that somebody doesn't know it, or it could be that you do know it, because it was revealed to you by the person who it was given to to reveal it. Uh, it's often been <clears throat> compared to like an initiation. You know, when you're in, you know, the, the secrecy of certain clubs, you know. Uh, and as soon as you're initiated into the club, well, now we can tell you. You know, that's, that's the word mysterion, is, is something that is hidden, but it is revealed. And you would not have known it except that it had been revealed to you. So it's a little bit of a different understanding. So, you know, he, that's why he's saying here, um, but in those days the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. And this is, it's like the revelation. What is God is revealing to us is going to be finished. So it's not that it's something that's not known. This is what we're doing right here. This is, we're unveiling the mystery. Um, Declared to his prophets his servants, the prophets, and he's talking about the Old Testament, too. Because a lot of things in, in Revelation brings light to things that are from the Old Testament. So then the end of the book, I mean, the end of this chapter, John um, eats the little book. Um, it's an interesting picture. Jeremiah 15, 16. Uh, Jeremiah is told to eat a book. And Ezekiel 2. Um, matter of fact, you can turn there if you like. To Ezekiel 2. <clears throat> Just before Daniel. Just the right number. 
There's four more copies of the handout on the printer in there if you want to grab them. You can grab them later. Ezekiel 2. Ezekiel uh, 2, starting at verse 9. Actually goes into verse into chapter 3. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And when he spread it before me, there was writing on the inside and on the outside. Okay. That sound familiar. And written on were lamentations and mournings and woe. And we don't really know what this little book is. You know, for all we know, it could have been a bridge version of the big scroll. But the big scroll was too big for John to eat, so God wanted him to eat it, so it was made small. I don't know. We don't really know what, what that scroll is. <clears throat> um, moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate it, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. For you are sent to the people of unfamiliar speech and hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, whose words cannot understand. Surely I have sent you to them. They would have listened to you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard hearted. Uh, Verse 14. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. So the point of this was God was giving Ezekiel something to say to the people. And it's the Word of God, so it's sweet. It is the Word of God is sweetness to our souls, like honey from the honeycomb, right? But sometimes delivering it can be bitter. And um, you know, if you've ever had to um, reprove somebody, if you've ever had to deliver, if, if you're a parent or if you're a pastor or somebody, or, or you know, um, you've got to deliver the word of God to somebody, you know they're not going to like it. There's there's bitterness in it, and so <clears throat> you know, this is God communicating with John that look, the, the word of God is sweet because it's truth. But sometimes this delivery can be can be bitter, and, and what he's getting ready to do, because we're getting ready to start off to sound the um, seventh trumpet, which is going to kick into the seven bowls, and we're going to be entering into a very very bitter stage of, of the tribulation. <coughs> um, so, back in Revelation, that was chapter ten. Move on to chapter 11, which is the two witnesses and the seven tru uh, and the uh, seven trumpet. And you know this is a very controversial section because there is no shortage of speculation on, on what's, what goes on in this chapter. But it stop, starts off introducing these two witnesses. Uh, actually, it starts off with measuring the temple, and this is really interesting. Um, in Ezekiel 40, chapter, chapters 40 through 43, actually, there's this whole thing that he takes Ezekiel through this process of measuring the temple. And he measures the entire temple. Right? Everything. The outer courts and everything. That temple is the millennial temple. The temple that's going to exist in the millennial reign on earth. Well, this temple, apparently, is the temple that is on earth at this time during the tribulation. And he tells, so it's the third temple. First temple was Solomon's temple. Second temple is, is called Herod's temple, but it's, it's really the temple that, that Ezra and Zerubbabel built. Um, uh, but Herod later aggrandized it. He added to it and remodeled it, and so it's called Herod's temple. That was the second temple. Uh, that was the one that was destroyed in 70 AD. The third temple is the temple that's going to be built in Jerusalem during the time of the tribulation, probably put early the first three and a half years. So this apparently is a description of that, but he tells him, he says, you know, measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court, which is outside the temple, 
and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Um, the, as most of you know, the Temple Mount currently in Israel, okay, there it is here. Okay, the, there's lots of speculation as, at this point, as to where the original temple was, where either one of the temples were, because it, actually they believe that the two temples were in two different spots on this Temple Mount. So, uh, there is some speculation that, I'll, I'll leave that for a second, that the, this spot, where the Dome of the Rock is, is the site of the original Solomon's Temple. But that Herod's temple was built somewhere over here in its original construction. Now, for years, I remember, you know, now decades ago, listening to Hal Lindsey, um, the late great planet Earth. I remember the late great planet Earth. It was back in the early 70s. Um, he talked about, well, the only way they're ever going to be able to build a, a, um, uh, a temple on the Temple Mount is if they destroy the Dome of the Rock. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a hole. If you go to Israel, how many have been to Israel already? You got a few, right? There, have you guys visited the Temple Institute? And there's the Temple Institute there, and they're talking about building the temple. There's a whole process going on where they're talking about it. Now, don't take it too far, because the reality is, if you, if you talk to the average Israeli on the street, they could care less. They could, could not care less whether or not a temple is built. They have no interest in having a temple. 90% of, of, of Israel is secular. They are Jewish in, in culture and in ethnicity, not necessarily in faith. You know, even if they go to temple, even if they go to the synagogue, um, they're really not. They're not interested. The idea of sacrificing animals is very distasteful to them, and they have no interest in it. But there is a group of people that are very, very, very interested in building the temple, and the idea is. That if they were to build the temple, okay, on this spot right about here, okay, they could fit the temple. Now, if you built the entire temple, uh, it sort of dwarfs the dome of the rock, and they're unlikely to get away with this. Okay? But it's interesting that it says here, don't measure the outer courts. Just the sanctuary, which is holy place of the Holy of Holies. So I did a little bit of uh, photoshopping here. Mm -hmm. And that looks a little more plausible as a possibility, at least a physical possibility. Right now, you couldn't get away with that. Right now, there's no way. Because here's the thing. It, you know, because it says, it's interesting, it says, for it has been given, the outer courts and all that, has been given to the Gentiles. Well, this whole... This, you know, if you go to Jerusalem now, um, you know, Jerusalem is, the city itself is under Israeli government, except the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount belongs to the Palestinians. It belongs to the Muslims. They have retained ownership and control. So if you go to Israel and you go through all kinds of checkpoints and this and that to get into this area, if you want to go up to there, you have to go through the, the Palestinian checkpoints and the Palestinian police and guards and all that kind of stuff. Uh, because it's like it's it's almost like um, going to Rome and going to the Vatican. Well, the Vatican is a separate country, technically speaking. The Va Vatican City is is a, is a sovereign nation, if you will, within Italy. And when you go to the Vatican, you have to wait this long line along this giant wall, surrounded by a giant wall. And then when you finally get in, there's a whole process you have to go through. You have to they, you check your passport, you don't you have to have your ID and everything to get in. Same thing here. It's like it doesn't, you know, it's, it's part of Jerusalem, but it is unto itself. Okay. It is given over to the Gentiles. Isn't that an actual mosque? That's a mosque, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the third most holy mosque in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I, for whatever reason, I always forget the name of it. Alaska. What's that? Alaska. Alaska? Oh, oh. Alaska. 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 
I can't pronounce it. Oh, that's what it I'll is. It sounds <laughs> <laughs> Muslim. It could be, it could be that you're pronouncing it wrong. That doesn't. It has like three names: Al something something something. But anyway, um, but the um, the one in Mecca is obviously the most important one, uh, and then um, I can't think of the other one is, uh, and then this one is the third most holy, um, really the third most holy site for all Muslims. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a working mosque. It's a holy, holy site. If you want to trim your toenails. Yeah. Because they make you take off your shoes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is, you know what? It, you start looking at this, and it's a possibility. And it's interesting that it, it, it sort of words it this way. That, um, <clears throat> that this area, this outer courts, uh, is given to the Gentiles. And the time is going to come that these, these Gentiles... I'm going to tread the city underfoot, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be coming across that later as things sort of the tide turns for for Israel in the tribulation, uh, in the last half. Again, we see this this reference to 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years, so uh, it's the last half of the of the tribulation. Um, last thing about the temple is that. You know, this idea of measuring is, 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 is a sense of ownership, but it's also a, sort of a sense of, of assessment, of God taking a look at things and seeing how you measure up. Just like the, um, you know, uh, we talked about Daniel, Tekel Tekel, um, um, thank you, uh, Eupharsa, Tekel Tekel, many, many Tekel Eupharsa, that's what it is, many, many Tekel Eupharsa, which means you have been measured and found wanting. Right? Uh, a lot of people are very excited, and a lot of Christians are very excited about the idea of a temple being built in Jerusalem. Sounds like an exciting <laughs> thing. It's actually something that God despises. God does not want to see a temple built. There's no, re there's no need for a temple. There's no reason for a temple. The building of a temple is the rejection of Christ. Because, you know, He is our temple. He is the Holy of Holies. We don't need a temple. We're not making sacrifices anymore. The sacrifice is done. So the, the building of a temple is a greater slap in the face to the price that, that, that Christ paid on the cross. And that's why, you know, as much as we sort of anticipate it as a sign, as a super sign for the, for the, the, the coming uh, of, the, of the end of days, uh, it's really not something that God is interested in at all. It is an act of rebellion against God. Is, is that, isn't that what they talked about with uh, the empty price doing that, building the temple? That, he, that is probably going to be, that's why a guy who can do this, if, if there's a guy that can make that happen, that's going to be one powerful guy. He'd have to be able to make a great deal. Yeah. He'd have to be a deal maker. Yeah. Or Maybe he, the art of the deal. Or he would, yeah. <laughs> Or he would, uh, he would have to have something on the Muslims. He would have to have something real strong. You know, like, you're going to do this, uh, or else. Or, you know, who knows what's in, what's in the works? Because we know in the middle of the tribulation, it all turns around, and, they, and they, he turns his back on them, and it says they're going to trod the city on foot. So it could be just a thing of, look, you're going to get your city. But let's do this for now. And then, in a few years, when the opportunity is right, when they're not looking, when they're not ready, when their guard is down, we're just going to take them out and they'll be gone. And maybe that's, maybe that's the deal he's going to make. We don't know. But, um, but that's the idea behind the temple, that there is going to be a temple built, and that's going to be part of the, part of the deal, this covenant that, that, that the Antichrist will make that this man will make um, with uh, the people of Israel. So we get to the two witnesses. They're going to prophesy for 1,260 days, which is 42 months, which is three and a half years. It's all the same. This is more than likely going to be the first half of the tribulation. That they are going to be starting their ministry at the very beginning of the tribulation, and then as we get toward the middle, when things really start getting ugly, that's when they... That's when they're going to start facing resistance, and they're they're going to end up being killed. Um, it seems it seems likely that that's even though it, it talks about them holding back the rain and setting plagues and things like that. Um, 
you know, there probably will be some of that during the first three and a half years, but not to the degree uh, that we're going to see tonight. So it's in all likelihood that although the two books that I used, Tim LaHaye says no, this is definitely over here, definitely in the second half, and um, uh, how late is it? No, 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 no. no. My guy, who's my guy? Chuck Russell? Um, Chuck Russell? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, Welbert, John Welbert. He, um, he's the, he, he commentary. He has, he's got the commentaries out. And he has one on the book of Revelation. Uh, he says the first, first three and a half years. I tend to lean toward the first three and a half years. David Gusick thinks that it's the first three and a half years. It just seems to fit better. I talked about these guys being the two lampstands and the two olive trees. Um, again, Old Testament pictures, Zechariah 4, talks about the lampstand, and the lampstand being connected to the olive trees, and it's sort of a figurative picture because obviously it's a little silly. You know, the olives have to be stamped out and squished, and the oil extracted from them, and then they put them in. But the point is that, you know, these lamps, you have to keep putting oil in them. You have to keep putting oil in them, or they'll run out. But if you connected it right to the olive tree, you know, then you get all the oil you want. Uh, again, figuratively speaking. So that's sort of the picture that these guys are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. You know, they're going to be like John the Baptist or Jesus in that sense, constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and um, that that's the picture of the two lampstands. And they got a great power, great protection. Uh, now the big question, the question of all questions, who are these guys? Okay. We don't know. We don't know. There's speculation all over the place. There's really no, there's very little basis on any speculation as to who these two guys are. Uh, you can go all kinds of places. I mean, people say it's going to be Moses and Elijah. Elijah seems to be a popular uh, choice. Uh, some people say Elijah and Enoch because uh, they're the two men in the Bible that never die. You know, that they're going to come back. And then they're going to they're going to die for the first time. Um, it's possible. Um, I don't you know I don't know that that you know Enoch. I mean we know that Enoch was a man who walked with God and was not and certainly was a man of God. There was even a book supposedly written either by him or about him, uh, the Book of Enoch. Um, but we don't know much about any ministry that he had of this of this kind. Elijah certainly had a ministry like this, holding back the rain. Um, you know, Moses certainly had a ministry like this, um, again, prophesying, working miracles. Uh, so it's, uh, people say, some people say John the Baptist. Now, it could be someone like, it's not likely going to be John the Baptist, um, because John the Baptist was sort of an Elijah-like person. And it may be that these two guys are going to be like that. They're going to be like an Elijah and a Moses. So they're going to be like an Elijah and an Enoch. They're going to have that same kind of ministry. It may just be um, two very Holy Spirit filled believers that are just called by God to take on this ministry. And capable of doing amazing things. I mean, um, apparently, if anybody resists them, fire comes out of their mouth. You know, that's something that could be literal. It could be just something that John is seeing and doesn't can't quite translate what's going on. It could be just a protection from God. Um, but we don't know exactly. We don't know for sure. There's no way of knowing for sure who these guys are. Just that they are witnesses. They are they are men with a testimony. Men who are witnessing for Christ. They're delivering the gospel. Um, and they, they minister for three and a half years, and they must be an annoyance to everybody, to the people, to the, the beast, the Antichrist, and finally, he is killed. I mean, they are killed. And um, we see an unusual thing where basically it becomes Christmas. People are celebrating the death of the two, the two witnesses, and they're exchanging gifts, and they're all having a great time. Um, and then, you know, David Gusick talks about this. He says, I can, he goes, I wish I, he goes, in one sense, I wish I could be there, watching it on TV. You know, CNN is there, and they're filming it, and the cameraman's got, you know, 
the, 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 uh, the anchor guys there. I'm here on location in Jerusalem, and, and the guys are dead in the background, and the two witnesses are dead, and then all of a sudden, you know, three days later, three and a half days later, they get up. You know, the cameraman's like, uh, you might want to turn around. Mm -hmm. um, what a scene that's going to be, because it does say that everybody is going to see it. You know, it says that the whole world, uh, and they heard a loud voice of heaven saying, come up, and there they ascended into heaven in the clouds, and their, enemies, and their enemies saw them. The same hour there was a great earthquake, tent city. There's a verse 9. Oh yeah, and those from peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in the grave. You know, I, there was a time when that, you know, that just seemed nonsensical. How can, how can everybody in the world see it? Mm. Well, nowadays, that's not, that's not a big deal at all. You can see it a lot. Doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that every single individual on the earth, but it means that this is an event that's going to be broadcast around the entire world. And not now. I mean, I remember back in, you know, back in the 80s, you used to say, oh, satellite TV, you can see it anywhere. Now you can just pick up your, your iPad and watch it. You know, you can, it'll be on YouTube. Um, you know, people are going to be watching this all over the place. So, um, you know, it makes me think how many will see this and believe. You know, we know there's going to be a great... Revival. These men, along with 144,000, uh, along with others, are going to be spreading the gospel. And, you know, this is going to be an interesting turn of events, particularly, I think, for the Jews, to, to see this kind of thing happen and, and how, many, how many people will turn and believe because of this event. And so then it says that the second woe is over, that was the second woe, and now we get to the seventh trumpet finally in the end of chapter 13. Um, and when the seventh trumpet sounds, we just see worship in heaven, and the temple, the, the, the temple in heaven that we talked about opens. And that's, you know, that's kind of like not a good thing when you think about that. I mean, you just listen to the, in verse 19, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Um, I mean, the Ark of the Covenant is not supposed to be seen by anybody but the, but the priests. And, you know, we know now, you know, that the, the, the veil was rent in heaven. But now this is sort of a picture of the temple just being burst open. It's time for God. Because, you know, keep in mind, we, you know, we're sort of speaking symbolically. The temple is the dwelling place of God. It's the throne room. The Holy of Holies is the throne room of God. And now it's like he's kicked open the doors. And he's coming. And so there's sort of this impending doom that's left in, uh, in the end of verse of uh, chapter 11. So, so now we go to uh, chapter, we're going to do chapters 12 and 13 sort of together because they, they really go together. We're going to see in chapters 12 and 13, we're going to see four very important personages um, that are brought to light in, this, in these two chapters. The first one is this woman. The woman who's clothed in the sun and giving birth to a child. Okay? Um, almost universally, this is seen as Israel. Um, the only exception is that most Catholics, most Catholic scholars believe that this is Mary. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense that it literally is Mary. I mean, we know, you know, that, that we understand the reasoning why they would say that, because she bore a male child who would rule all the nations that are out of iron. So, yes, Mary bore Jesus, you know, gave birth to Jesus, who is, who is going to be that, that king who will rule the earth with a rod of iron. But the, this picture of this woman, it's bigger than Mary. It's more than just a literal, talking about a literal birth. Number one, because he says, now a great sign appeared in heaven. Now here, here John is helping us out. You know, we, we, sort, of, we sort of go through the, the book of Revelation going, okay, is this a sign? Is this literal? Is this a sign? Is this literal? And we know, you know, we, we look at the, the, um, 
the old axiom, you know, if, if the plain sense makes the most sense, seek no other sense. And the reverse of that, if the plain sense makes no sense, then seek another sense, you know. <laughs> so we're sort of playing this game as we go through Revelation. And now John gives us a gimme. Hey, guys, this is a sign. This is, this is a symbol, okay? Don't take this literally, he's saying. This is a sign. And so here's this woman clothed with the sun. And, you know, if you, again, like these, if you, if you want to know if it's literal or not, just keep following it through. And if it starts to really make no sense, then, it, you know, then it's, it's, it's not, it's not, or I'm sorry, it's the other way around. If you, if you take it as a, as a symbol, and then you start following through, and you can't find a place for all the little pieces, you know, like this woman runs out and is protected, you know, for, for three and a half years in the wilderness. Well, when did that happen to Mary? You know, she wasn't, she didn't run in the wilderness for three and a half years and was protected. Um, could it be, like, in Scripture and, and, you know, a lot in Proverbs, as well as other Scripture, that wisdom is referred to as a sheep? Well, wisdom is referred to as a sheep, but the other thing that's also referred to as a sheep is religious systems in the, in the Old Testament. That religious systems are referred to as a sheep. Israel is referred to as a sheep. My wife, uh, God calls Israel a harlot. The church is a bride. Um, um, evil religious systems are referred to, we saw in early on in Revelations, uh, by Jezebel. You know, so there are there are sort of references toward uh, religious systems being referred to in, in the feminine. Now, here's the other thing for me that clinches it. And it was one of the first things when I read it that, for me, identified it as Israel. Is that in Genesis 37, Joseph tells his father about a dream. Tells his brothers and then tells his father about a dream. You guys remember the first dream there? About, I saw, you know, the, the stars. I saw the 11 stars. And I saw the sun and the moon. And the sun and the moon were Jacob and Rachel. And the 11 stars were the 11 other tribes of Israel, besides Joseph. So, in here, we have, she's clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a garland of 12 <coughs> stars. So, there's, there's a real parallel to me in Genesis 37, of the sun and the moon and the 12 stars representing Israel. And that this woman is just representing the nation of Israel, the, the, the Jewish people as a whole, giving birth to their Messiah, giving birth to the, the one who would reign with a rod of iron. Um, immediately after this, we see, and we'll get back to the woman in a minute, we sort of bounce back and forth between the woman and this next, this next character, um, the dragon. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and seven and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Again, people speculate all over the place. And this is this is one of the things that, that's really interesting because you know, there's a, uh, one of the guys, I think it was I can't remember if it was LaHaye or, um, or the other guy who was saying, well this is clearly just talking about the, the new Roman Empire. And um, there's only one problem with that. In verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So again, we got a gimme. That's who the dragon is. He tells us, you want to know who the dragon is? This is who the dragon is. He's Satan. That's, that's the dragon. So this dragon, he's got the, the, the seven head, the ten horns. You know, and this is just some, you know, some very fanciful imagery for us, you know. Seven is a, is a, is a term of completion, a wholeness, a, um, you know, having to do with his authority, that he has authority on the earth, okay. The, the horns speak of power, crowns speak of kingdoms, you know, and this probably is going to be referring, because we get to the beast, we're going to see some similarities between the beast and the dragon. And his crowns and the heads is one of them. And, um, <clears throat> and it's going to represent ten nations or ten, ten government systems, ten kingdoms. Um, 
and then we see that his tail drew a third of the stars. You know, and this was sort of going back. This seems to be referring to his original fall when Satan fell. He drew a third of the stars or a third of the angels with him when he fell. Speaking of his demon armies. Right? And he desired to devour the child. And if you look through history, again, we're sort of like, we're in this parenthesis, so there is no chronology. We're going to jump all over the place. If you look through history, all that Satan has done to prevent the birth of Jesus. You know, we look at Genesis 6 with the pollution of the race. We look in, in Esther with Haman trying to exterminate. Uh, we look at Herod killing all the firstborn children in, in, in Bethlehem. You know, there's, uh, and those are just three examples of, of um, areas where Satan has tried to destroy the Jewish people or corrupt the Jewish people before they could give birth to the Messiah. Um, so then we go back to the woman. She's, she has her baby. And the baby is immediately, this is the child, is immediately caught up to heaven. So we see this, again, sort of this, this picture of Jesus. It's, it doesn't say anything about his ministry, about his work, about his sacrifice on the cross. But it just says, she bore a child who was to, who was to rule over nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. So speaking of the ascension of Christ. right? And then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed there 1,260 days. Again, three and a half years. So there's a, this kind of jumps ahead. This goes from the ascension to the tribulation. You really jump the entire church age. Again, remember the, the, the picture of the, uh, the prophet and the mountain peaks. You know, we're just going to jump ahead to the tribulation where at some point Israel is going to run into the wilderness and hide. And um, this, people have talked about this. Is this where I am here? Yeah. Uh, Petra is a place that is actually in Jordan. It's in um, sort of uh, southwestern Jordan. Uh, and it's a place that, as you can see, it's, a, it's, a, it's a basically a community built into the rocks. There's nothing that really lives there now. Um, but at one point, this must have been some kind of city. And people have, um, Matthew 24, 16, we'll just go there, and then I'll tell you the rest of the verses. Matthew 24, 16, this is partly why people have speculated this. Therefore, when you have 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand that let those who are in the in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is in the housetop go down to the lake to take anything out of his house. Um, and in verse 20, pray for your flight that it may not be in winter or in the Sabbath. And, and, you know, this is talking about the, the great tribulation, um, the last three and a half years. And this, so this sort of this picture that Israel is going to run to the mountains. That's basically what this is. It's a city built into the mountains. And we can see sort of where its location is. And the other verse that's interesting, I'll just, I'll just read from there. Daniel 11, bringing us back to the book of Daniel. In verse 41... He also shall enter the glorious land, speaking of the, the Antichrist. Um, he shall enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. So, he's going to, apparently, the Antichrist is, gonna, is going to have control over all the land all around, but Edom, Moab, and Ammon, for some reason, are going to escape his grip. So, this is going to be a safe area. And so it's believed that that's where they're going to run to. It's about 100 miles from Jerusalem to Petra, just to give you an idea. So, Rick, the timeline here is this is after 
a lot of this stuff, mo most everything is done, right? No, this is, this is right, basically at the midpoint. Okay. Just about at the midpoint, maybe right after the midpoint. This is the thing when, when, thing, when, when the Antichrist breaks his, his covenant with them, and now he's turning his guns on them. And, and because it says that she's going to hide there for three and a half years. You know, I just find it interesting that at that point um, in Matthew, just after that, um, it says, if, if then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, believe them not, because there will be a lot of false Christ. But the church is gone, and really what's left is people running for their kind of existence at that point. <clears throat> um, right. Not obviously not saying that they're Christians. Uh, right. I just find it interesting that not they're that talking point, to Israel, that... they're talking to the Israelis, or the, yeah. the, the Jewish people, that they're looking for Christ. Yeah, they're going to be looking for the Messiah. And, well, and a lot of people are going to be seeing the Messiah and the Antichrist. And that's why he says, you know, don't believe him. Yeah. Because, because, you know, I mean, who says that I am the Christ, don't believe him. But the time hadn't come yet for his return. Because when he comes, they'll know it. And, and they'll be, you know, it is part of this process that, that, you know, at some point, the Jewish people as a whole are going to turn and realize that Jesus is the Messiah. And they're going to accept him as the Messiah. I'm, I'm not saying that every single Jewish person is going to believe, but as a people, they're going to recognize that their anointed one that they've been waiting for has already come. And this is sort of the beginning of that time when they're going to start realizing that, when they realize that he is not their Messiah. You know, but some will, and some, some will stay, because it even talks about... Um, And the dragon was enraged with the woman because he can't he can't get at her because it says the earth is going to open up and you know he's going to send uh, an army. Um, well, he says a flood, but again we're looking at signs. So it's probably not going to be a flood. It's probably going to be a flood of army, a flood of people after her. But she's not. But but God is going to open up the ground and swallow them up, and they're not going to be able to get at them. Wherever it is they're hiding, whether it's Petra or wherever it is, they're not going to be able to get at them. And um, so it says he's going to be enraged. And then he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So I think this is sort of that point when things are changing. People are really starting to believe. Jews are starting to believe. This could also be referring to Gentile believers as well. But now he's going to turn his guns on Christians, which he's probably already sort of turned his guns on anyway, but to some degree he's going to be turning his gun really heavy on, on, on the Christians because Israel is hiding in the mountains. So so then, um, to back up a little bit now, we go back to the dragon. It talks about who, who, who the dragon is. It's Satan. It talks about him being cast out of heaven. Uh, but this is not his original fall. This is not being cast out of heaven the first time. Um, this is talking about you know, sometimes we have a hard time understanding that Satan is before God. Because we know that no wicked thing can be before God. However, we know that Satan makes accusations day and night before the throne of God. We know that Satan went before God for Job. So, while on one hand, yeah, God cannot have anything that is not pure before him. But on the other hand, Satan has had access. And how we reconcile that, I'm not sure. But we know that Satan has an access in heaven. But now apparently he is going to be completely cast out to the point where he is no longer even going to have access before God anymore. Now the days of his accusing the brethren are over because there's no one to accuse us to. And, and he's going to be cast out of heaven. And that there's going to be a war in heaven between Satan and Michael. You know, and again, this is a little misconception that, that often happens that... Um, that God and Satan are somehow equals. That Satan is the opposite of God. You know, God is the good guy and Satan is the bad guy. Um, Satan is a created being that can be destroyed, disintegrated with a glance from God. Uh, there is no competition. Uh, and this also, this also takes away from anybody, any of those, there's a couple of uh, 
religious organizations that believe that um, the Archangel Michael is actually Jesus Christ. Um, because there would be no war between Jesus Christ and the devil. There would not be a war. Because we're gonna, we see that later on after, after the thousand year reign, these people rebelled against God and it says, and then fire came down and burned them up. And that was it. You know, if, if Jesus wants to defeat Satan, if he doesn't have to go to war with him. Okay, there is no bad. So this is, a, this is a battle of equals. Michael is an archangel, just as Satan was an archangel in his original creation. So it says, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. So Satan is defeated, he is cast to the earth. Um, and now, he, now he's completely, now he's furious, and he's going to unleash his anger on the earth, especially Israel. And this is what starts his attack on the woman, and attack, you know, attack on Israel. Um, and, and then when he can't get hurt, he can do the rest of the offspring. So then we get to chapter 13, and we see the next personage, which is this beast from the sea. You see a beast rising out of the sea. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, gives us a picture of what is being talked about here. It's where it talks about the beasts. So we see a similar sort of picture of this beast with crowns and horns and things like that. Um, who is this beast? This beast is who is generally called the Antichrist. Now, oh, this, this back up. Okay. Who is the Antichrist? Now, I hope this doesn't come as a shock to you. That there's no place in the book of Revelation that calls him the Antichrist. Okay. He is called the Beast. The beast, of, the beast from the sea. Um, he is referred to as the Antichrist in 1 John in three places, and then in 2 John uh, in one place. That's the only place that talks about Antichrist. And most of the verses really is talking about the spirit of Antichrist. Um, but he, the idea of Antichrist is, um, don't think of, you know, we think of anti meaning opposite. It's not opposite, so he's not the opposite of Jesus. He is instead of Jesus. He is the counterfeit Jesus. Okay? Um, and that's, that's the terminology that we're looking at here, and that's why it fits with this beast and, and what we see is going to happen in the book of Revelation, that he is referred to as the Antichrist. Because he is the embodiment of the spirit of Antichrist that John speaks of. Um, and so he is the complete embodiment of that, of that idea of, of being the false Christ, of being the imitation of Christ. Interesting, again, we've got this similarity in Daniel. We've got the ten horns, the crown, the ten crowns. Uh, which equal um, ten kingdoms, which is the revival of the Roman Empire, the European community. We talked about this in Daniel, you know, about the um, how that fourth beast was the Roman Empire, but then it sort of grew into something else, just like the image, like you, you see a new thing. You know, the ten, it was the Roman Empire, but then it started gradually becoming something else, and then it sort of revived again in the end. Um, so we see this, whatever that means, some kind of European community, and we can see it going on today. And we know that there's more than 10 members in the uh, European Union, but that's now. You know, they're starting to drop like flies. You know, I remember when, it was, when there wasn't 10. And they were like, whoa, when it gets to 10, you better watch out. And then it went over 10. And now they're starting to lose people. So we don't know. It could be. Uh, but won't he have dominion over the whole earth? What's that? Won't the Antichrist have dominion over the whole earth? Yes, but, the, but sort of his base of operations, I think, is going to be out of Europe. And it's I heard it speculated that they actually divided the world up into ten regions. It could be. It's just the only the only struggle I have with that is fitting it into the Roman Empire. We know that there has to be a Roman Empire connection because that fourth beast goes to the end of the age. That fourth beast, which we know to be the Rome, the initial part of it, we know to be the Roman Empire, and it goes all the way to the coming of Christ. And we know that there's no Roman Empire now, so there has to be some kind of a rebirth or a rejuvenation of the Roman Empire or something resembling the Roman Empire. It could be because the Roman Empire ruled the known world at that time. 
But geographically, it didn't rule the entire world, because the entire world was barely even populated at that point. Um, so it could, you know, but the, the, I think that there has to be some kind of a tie to the Roman Empire. And we're going to see even a, another sort of interesting tie when we see later that the seven heads, we're going to be told later, I think in, in chapter 18 or 19, the seven heads represent the seven hills in which the city was built on. And Rome is known as the city of the seven hills. Um, so there's, there's some kind of Roman connection, you know, and it may have, and you know, some guys run really, you know, all the way to the extreme that it's the Pope and it's the Roman, it's the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, and, you know, I think that when we get to that place, I'll share a little bit more, but I think there's a connection. I think there's definitely, we're going to see a connection between the Roman Catholic Church whether it's the Roman Catholic Church in its current existence or a, a derivation of the Roman Catholic Church in that day, um, I think there's going to be some kind of a connection um, in there. But some run the full gambit and say that the Antichrist is the Pope and that you know the Catholic Church is the, is the whole thing. Um, I'm not sure that I'm all the way there. But there's definitely a connection. In, that, in, in the Roman sense, anyway, in the Roman Empire sense. And especially since we, we look at the description of this beast, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth of a lion. Okay, does that sound familiar? Yeah. Right? So, if you have... opposite order that Daniel had it. Um, and that these are the exact same animals that represent those other three kingdoms. Now it could, it could mean that uh, he comes from this area. But that's what he comes out of. Which is this, this is generally the area, you know, when we went through all the different kingdoms. You know, Baghdad, not Baghdad, but uh, Babylon, which is probably right about here, uh, was sort of the main area because it was certainly the headquarters of the Babylonian Empire. It was the second headquarters during the, um, the Medo-Persian Empire. That's where Darius set up his, and Darius to me, he set up his empire in Babylon. Daniel was with Darius. Um, and then even um, Alexander the Great was killed in Babylon. Well, not killed, he died in Babylon. Um, where he had, he had conquered it, and he was in there. So there may be some kind of geographical connection to these three things, or it could be that this new, this, this beast, who is going to be, he is both going to be a man, but he is also going to represent a uh, kingdom, if you will. Uh, almost in the same sense that if I say the Third Reich, everybody thinks Adolf Hitler. There is no other leader of the Third Reich. He is, he's the embodiment of, he is the Third Reich, or he was the Third Reich. That's how he's characterized. Uh, in the same way, this, this leader is going to be the embodiment of the government which he rules. So, um, it's both going to be a government and a man, and that this is going to have all the characteristics of the other three kingdoms. Um, I think it's more likely that somehow geographically there's going to be some kind of a connection. That's the first thing that, again, I, to me it's just it's when I read it, in plain sense, that's the first thing that occurred to me, that somehow geographically there's a connection. But it may not be. Um, talks about his, his head being wounded. Uh, could be literal, or could represent, you know, some people have said it could represent the resurrected Roman Empire, that the resurrected Empire was dead, now it seems like it's being raised up again. Could be. Most people think it represents an actual um, wounding. The only thing with that to consider, and I'm not against that either. I think that's 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 a, that's a, that's a likelihood. 
But it does, it's one of the heads was wounded. Not the beast itself. It was only one of the heads was wounded. A mortal wound. Uh, and and um, was uh, healed. So, I don't know. It could be either way. But it's just, again, something, something to consider. That it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to receive some kind of a, a, a wound. He's going to be have an assassination attempt. And he's going to be revived. It could be because then that also um, lends credence to what we're going to see, which is sort of a, a fake trinity, which we'll get into in a minute, that he is, he's doing things to imitate Christ, like you said, mm -hmm. and that he's going to have a fake resurrection as well. It's unlikely that he's going to be killed and then be raised from the dead, but he may get people to believe that he was killed and then be raised from the dead. So... Um, he ends up being worshipped by the world. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon because, you know, we look at that today and say, eh, I have a hard time believing that the world is going to bow down and worship some guy. You know, the world is not, you know, we're moving into secularism. We're not moving into weird paganism. Um, we worship people. Um, but in the Roman Empire, when the, when the, when the Roman Empire... Uh, demanded worship of Caesar, it was, it was looked at as a political thing and not a religious thing. You know, the, the thing that got Christians into trouble during the early days of Christianity with the Roman Empire is they said, look, all you have to do is burn a little pinch of incense and say, Caesar is God, and that's it. We don't care what else you believe. Believe whatever you want. This is just your allegiance. So that we know that you are loyal to the Roman Empire. You, pinch, you have a little pinch of incense, you burn it, and you say... Caesar is Lord, and that's it. And then go about your business and live your life, be a Christian, we don't care. Well, Christians wouldn't do that. You know, because it was worship. And they wouldn't say that anybody else is Lord except Jesus. Um, in, the, in the mind of, of the, the Romans, it was a political worship. It was an allegiance. It was more of a political allegiance than it was a religious thing. So it may be something along those lines, where it's more of a, a political allegiance, where people are enamored with him, certainly, um, and that they have an inordinate attraction to him, and then, and that they, they um, <coughs> lend their allegiance to him in a very powerful way, in almost in a, in a worship sense, you know, sort of worship him like he is a god. Um, so it's like a religion without God which I think the world can get behind, because the world doesn't have a problem with religion, it just has a problem with God, right? So he's going to have a world-dominating empire, uh, and he's going to be that leader that embodies that empire, like we said. Uh, and then it says that he's going to make war with the saints. And again, we, we sort of saw that in the previous chapter, when, when he doesn't get his way, he turns around and makes war. Uh, so then the last personage that we run into here in chapter 13 is the beast from the earth. So we've got this other beast now. This bird beast isn't coming out of the sea. Now, beast coming out of the sea, you know, we talk about the sea represents humanity. The sea of humanity, the broad sea of all humanity, Gentiles and everybody, right? Well, the sea coming out of the earth, many think, represents Israel. And that maybe this false prophet is going to be a Jew. Um, I'm not saying he's going to be a, a Jewish in the in the faith sense, but he may be Jewish in the ethnic sense. And that, that he comes up out of the land as, as opposed to the sea of humanity, a specific portion of the earth. Uh, so he's similar to the other beast uh, in that he exercises the same power, but he gets his power from that beast. Right? Um, he is a religious personality. He puts, he, he's, he later we'll see that he's called the false prophet in, in chapter 16, 19, and 20. He's called the false prophet. He performs great signs. He, he uh, breathes, it says he breathes breath into the image. Right? Uh, which, by the way, this, this image, it may be the likeness of the beast, but it's the image of the beast that makes people, he gets people to bow down. He gets people to, he's the one that's going to get people to take the mark. He's like the voice, you know. He's the mouthpiece for the Antichrist. He's going to buy. He's going to be the guy that's going to be on TV every day, 
talk about what a great guy this guy is and we need to get behind him. He's going to be the PR guy, really whooping it up. He's going to be getting people to take the mark. He's going to be, it says he's going to breathe image into the, uh, breathe life into the image of the beast. That could be, literal, it could be some kind of an image that is built that could be resemblance of, of the Antichrist uh, or it could just be like um, Nebuchadnezzar's image, which was probably an obelisk or something like that. Um, it could also be something as simple as, as a video broadcast. As John is looking, he sees the, the beast talking, but it's not him. It's an image of him. You know? And it's this guy, this PR guy, that causes all this to happen. So it could be something as, as sort of practical and, and pragmatic as that. Uh, and his job is to point people to the beast. So we have the dragon, who is the devil, right? He gives power to the beast that comes out of the sea. And this beast is a, uh, an imitation of Christ. The dragon is like an imitation of the father. And then we have this false prophet. And what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit says, look at Jesus, right? That's his ministry. Look at Jesus. Look at him. Look at him. Everybody pay attention to him. Well, that's going to be his ministry to the Antichrist. Everybody look at this guy. Look at him. Everybody pay attention. So he's almost going to be like a false Holy Spirit. So you get this false trinity going on in, their, in Satan's attempt to take, take on the personage of God. Right? Um, that, that's almost like the, the devil in the trinity. You have the, the, uh, the dragon, which is the devil, and mm -hmm. then the beast. Like three of them. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah that they're that they're a false trinity, which is yeah. really kind of scary. Yeah, it's really scary. That's I mean, it's 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 Satan trying really trying to imitate God. And what is he saying? What is what did he say in Isaiah? I will be like the Most High. Right. All right. So now we're moving on. Chapter 14. We're going to move on kind of quickly from here too. Um, and we still, you know, we've, we've blown the seventh trumpet, but we haven't gotten to any of the bowls yet. You know? Um, and now we see the Lamb standing on Zion. Okay, this appears to be the end of the tribulation. Because Jesus is now standing in Jerusalem. And the 144,000 are there, and they're still alive. They've made it through. And there's some question as to whether or not they're there, or whether or not they're in heaven. And I think they're both. Because I think this is that, that point in, in, in history where Jesus comes down, and he's both coming down and he's taking those people with him so that, um, because it talks about there before the throne. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. So, you know, they're sort of both. They're on the earth and they're in heaven. Um, some say it's a different 144,000. Because they say, well, this 144,000 clearly is in heaven to sing the song before the throne. So it can't be the 144,000 um, before. I think that's, that's kind of why are you looking for another 144,000? I mean, you know, it, it, the, the description, you know, they're sealed on their head and their hand. And there's, there's so many similarities, but because there's a few things that are different, it didn't mention their nationality in the other one in, in chapter 7. It didn't mention the fact that they were virgin in, in the, in, the um, in chapter 7. Um, but in my opinion, you know, you got 144,000 and later another 144,000 show up. I think it's the same 144,000. Again, I just, the plain sense, what's the first thing that occurs to me when I look at it in the, in the easiest understanding of it, and that's what I think it is. Um, and then we have three angels, right? We have three angels. One is, and this is, you know, again, as, as fantastical as this sounds, I'm just going to take it that it's an angel. That it's not, you know, um, it's not, uh, is, it, is it TBN that has a satellite they call Angel One? I think it's TBN. They have, an, they have a satellite up. They call Angel One because they say that's going to be, the, that's the angel. That's going to be going across the sky with the gospel. Uh, I think it's more likely that it's just going to be an angel that is going to be flying through the sky giving the gospel. Uh, and this is, again, we're at the very end of the tribulation at this point. Remember, we're going to the end, 
You know, we're, we're at the end of the trumpet, so we are here, but we're before the bowls, so we're, we're right at the end here. And God is offering one last opportunity to hear the gospel before, before his return, right? Uh, second angel, fallen is Babylon. It talks about the falling of Babylon, uh, which Babylon represents mankind in organized rebellion against God. Think about that. When we hear Babylon, you know, it can be a religious system, but Babylon, it started with Nimrod. Nimrod did great exploits before God, right, in Genesis. And that word, did ex great exploits before God, doesn't mean for God. It means he did great exploits and he threw them in God's face. That's what that means. He did it in God's face. Like, look at everything I've done. And I'm going to build a tower. And we don't need God. Because look how amazing we are. You know, that's the original Babylon. And then, so Babylon represents this sort of this rebellion, this independent rebellion, man being organized against God. And um, so this, this system, whether it's a religious system or a governmental system, is going to be destroyed. We're going to see more. I'm going to talk a lot about Babylon because we're going to see a lot more of it in chapter 17 and 18. And then we have the third angel who declares a curse of condemnation on those who receive the mark. It talks about the full strength of God's wrath, undiluted, untempered wrath on those who receive the mark. And then we have that, uh, you know, and it's, I mean, the picture here is just, you know, wrath of God which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment ascends forever and ever. And there's that forever and ever. Okay. There's, there's not going to be an annihilation. There's not going to be a modified annihilation. Okay. Annihilationism is believing that when people die, they just go nowhere. Job's witness to believe that. You die, you don't go anywhere. You just cease to exist. Um, Seventh-day Adventists, I believe, believe in a modified annihilationism. You exist for a time, you pay for your sins, and then you, are, you cease to exist. Um, there's not going to be any of that. Forever and ever means forever and ever. Yeah, that's the, you know, we shared in our um, uh, basic theology class about that. We had a young lady here who was a Jehovah's Witness, and she had a real hard time with that. She had a real difficult time. We actually had, that was it. After I had that discussion with her, we never saw her again. Because she couldn't believe that God would, would ever commit anybody to eternal torment. You know? mm -hmm. And what I told her is, look, the best I can come up with is that the Bible tells me that the soul does not die. The worm dieth not. That there's something about the creation of a soul. That when God creates a soul, it cannot be uncreated. That a soul is an eternal thing. Because it comes from God, and God is eternal. So that soul has to exist somewhere. And it either exists in the presence of God for eternity, or exists in that place that he prepared for the devil and his angels. And that's the best explanation I can make for justifying what some people think is, is, is harshness on God's part. Right? Doesn't the Bible allude that some will be cast into the outer darkness? I think it's still the same thing. Same I think thing. it's just another another terminology you for it. Levels of hell. Uh, there may be there may be levels of hell. There may be degrees of suffering and torment. I don't think any of it's going to be a joyride. I don't think any of it's going to be temporary either. I think it's whatever it is, it is. You know, I think I think it may be. You know, some have said that. Um, Whatever it is that your vice was on earth, I mean, just to give it, a, just to give an illustration of what you know, what it could be, um, whatever your vice was here on earth, it will just be completely unsatisfied. You will live in eternity with that desire being unsatisfied. You know, so depending on what your, how severe your vices were, it may be worse in hell. Um, but. It's, it's, you know, well, there may be degrees in hell just as there are rewards in heaven, but, yeah, I think it's, it's still, it's forever and ever. Okay. Um, 
a lot of these things that we're trying to describe suggest similarities to a time element, like we're here. That's the hardest thing to, to yeah. reconcile. Time versus God in his eternity. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think of it as time going on forever and ever. I think of it as just... Well, like it's, it's just it's their permanent life. existence. It's what yeah. it is. It's just a permanent existence. Yeah, it's not, it's not going on forever and ever. There's just no end to it because well, it's just... You also said that the creation of a soul, well, chances are that's a reference to time also, right? I think they were all, always with God. I think there always was God. I don't think it was always me. I think God created my soul. Yeah, I, and that gets into some pretty heavy stuff. Is it the creation of a soul, whether my soul existed somewhere? Because then, then you start getting into what the Mormons believe. That our soul exists somewhere, and that God takes that soul and brings it down and gives, gives, well, gives it a body. I relate and, to it that the body is a creation, okay, a flesh creation, and the soul is applied to it, the right soul, the right soul. Yeah, but soul. I, I, the only problem I have with that is where was my soul before? <laughs> Did I exist before? Well, okay, you're talking about the creation of the soul, but then they have always been there. I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, soul has consciousness, so... That's that's where I get. I just get. That's why I say it gets into deep stuff. It gets into. I took a whole class on this stuff. It was like really bizarre when you get into the idea of the creation of the soul. What what is a soul, and the, and the, the, the consciousness of a soul and that kind of stuff. Whether or not your soul is created from the two souls of your parents, or it's something that's a third thing that's created by God. And yeah, there's a whole there's a whole philosophy. There's a whole wing of universities devoted to that kind of stuff. It gets it gets pretty. It's pretty heady, but I understand what you're saying. But it just gets, yeah, it can get pretty, um, pretty heavy. So anyway, so the point of this is that hell is forever, and that's just the emphasis that it's trying to make here. And then the, then the, it gives the, the, um, the adverse, which is then I heard a voice from saying to me, "Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on." Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. You know, so and that's sort of a a, an indication, okay, their works follow them, that they may, that there are rewards and things in heaven. They may, be, in one sense, levels in heaven, degrees of whatever, whether it's degrees of intimacy with God or degrees of understanding, um, but that their works follow them, that they're, you know, um, things that we do here on earth do receive recognition, you know, our works of faith receive recognition in heaven. Um, I think the bottom line is that, you know, in, in, uh, in Deuteronomy uh, 30, 19, you know, God said this, I have laid before you um, life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. And that these are the cho two choices you have. You can spend eternity in the, in the torment or you can have your rest from your labors. Sorry. What is your take on the mark of the beast? Like, the mark of the beast... And didn't they say <coughs> did, I, did I skip um, over that completely? Yeah, okay, I skipped yes, over it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did. I skipped over it. Um, and are the ones that are thrown into this torment are those only the ones with the mark of, that took the mark of the beast? Well, those are the ones that they're talking about here. here. They're not the only ones that are going to be there, but they're just saying that's what's going to happen to them. To them. That they're going to be part of that group because there's more. You know, we'll see that later in the White Throne Judgment, the sea gives up its dead. And, this, you know, this is lots. The mark of the beast um, is, you know, the, it, again, that's one of those. That's one of those things that that um, it's very controversial. What is it? We don't know exactly what it is. We know that it, it has something to do with numerology. It says it is the number of his name. Now, that. We, we can't waste our time trying to think, oh, whose name adds up to 666, number one, because we don't know, number one, this is written in Greek. So it could be referring to the Greek language, it could be referring to Hebrew, you know, it could be referring to English or whatever language the person is in and what, what their alphabet has. I mean, the, the Hebrew language was like taking the English language and saying, okay, A is one, B is two, C is three, and that kind of thing. You know, and that there is a numerology for everybody's name, and that it adds up to 666. And people have been through for years 
Julius Caesar, Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, Ronald, Ronald Reagan. You know, six 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 has been the has been the the um, you know the, the equation for a number of, of, of prominent figures, and it's probably it probably is the number for a bunch of people. Um, so there's no way of knowing who that's going to be by just adding up the numbers. Charlie? I haven't talked for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little note by mine. Mm -hmm. The universal product code that is on every item in a store is made up of three sets of six numbers. Mm -hmm. I have this down, so it's a computer thing worldwide. You know, and this universal product code came out of the UN. So it's worldwide. No matter where you go, they hit that thing with a computer with that little yeah. red light and it gives you more. And it could have something to do with that. I mean, it could, you know, we talk about it being a chip, you know, um, but it could be something as simple as just a, because that almost makes more sense because that is a mark. A chip isn't necessarily described as a mark, whereas that could be a mark and it could be something that isn't even seen. It's like, how many, you know, how many have been to uh, Disney and they got those new stamps? They put it in your, and you can't see it until they shine the light, and then you see Donald Duck, and you see Goofy, or something on your hand, and whatever that day is, if you don't have, if today's Goofy, and you got Donald Duck, you're not getting in, you know. Um, <clears throat> you know, they've got the, the, but you can't see it until they shine the light on it. So it could be something, and I'll tell you, the UPC is as old as that thing is. I mean, they, those UPC symbols um, codes came out in the 70s. And nobody remember, we all of us, we, what is that thing, what are all these lines for? We never knew what they were for. And, um, you know, even I have, you know, I do uh, Weight Watchers and I, on the app, you can go to the thing, you hit the barcode, and you can scan the, the item. And when you scan the item, it tells you how many points it is. And it gives you all the nutritional readout of that particular product, da, 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 da. You know, so there's a lot of information that's hidden in those little lines. And that could be, because you're right, it is it's three sets of six numbers. Um, because I have to use those things all the time. You know, you go to the store now, nobody prices products at the store anymore. So you have to go, you have to look, pick up the product. I look at the last four numbers of that, of the UPC code, and then I look at the label on the shelf, because I never know, because it's moved and moved, and I never know what the shelf is, but nobody, nobody puts a price on the actual item anymore. And they put it down in a place that's next to the wrong item. So I, I never trust those things. So I always make sure the UPC matches the, the price that's on the shelf, you know? Um, but they're, they're still in use, and they're still being used, you know, ubiquitously, everywhere, like Charlie said. So it could be. That could be it. And it could be something that's going to be received. The only thing I would tell you is this. I wouldn't worry too much about it, because we're going to be gone. gone before any of that happens. You know? We don't have to worry about, well, I took this thing, and I had a, you know, I have a medical chip put in me. Whatever, I would tell you this. If you're a born-again believer, right now, and you have anything put on you, it's not the mark. Because the mark doesn't come until the tribulation. Okay? And along with that mark is going, it comes an allegiance to that system. It's not just the mark. The mark bears no, has no power in and of itself except the acceptance of the mark. The acceptance of that mark is the burning of that incense to Rome, is what it is. Because there's going to be, there's a degree of allegiance to that governmental system that goes along with receiving that mark. It's not just going to be, okay, I just need to get my stamp on You know, there's going to be a degree of... By the time, time they're doling out the mark, those people have already made their choice anyway. Yeah. So it's not... Right. They're, 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 they're not doing it reluctantly. Oh, I don't think I be, want to get this. There's probably they going to be a, 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 a book of things to fill out, you know, signing... Yeah you know, releases and privacy agreements and all this kind of stuff and allegiances and you pr you promise not to do this and that and that, 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 you know, um, and allegiances to this, to this governmental system. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not hard to believe that, you know, what it says, it's not hard for us to imagine at all that it says that, he, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. You know, that, you know, I, I don't use cash anymore. 
And my wife always says, do you have a couple of dollars? I don't, I don't, I never, I almost never have cash on me anymore. I almost never use cash. That was probably a bad thing. But it's just not convenient for me to be sitting there. And, you know, I just like to swipe my card, to stick my chip in, and it's just, it's just easier, you know. And if I didn't have my card, I wouldn't be able to buy, I wouldn't be able to, you know, I would, there's a million things I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't have my card, if I didn't have my little chip card. And if I've got my little chip and my little thing in my hand, then I don't have to worry about losing it. You know, so you can see how that would be an attractive thing to people of that day, especially if they're in the middle of an economic, we've already heard about the economic ruin that's going to be happening. They've that, already got the technology, so. What's that? They already have the technology. Yeah, the technology is there. It's already, it's already there. And uh, for people to receive some kind of a mark that will, that will enable that to happen. You know, with, was other than other than that, with Laura, were there any specific questions you had? I don't know that I can answer any specific questions, but thank you for reminding yeah, me that I skipped over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just wanted to know your thoughts. And so, um, so where is the reference that says that exactly that that is definitely post rapture? Well, because this is where we are. You know, the rap in as far as the Book of Revelation. You know, everything from chapter four on. Is is post rapture because um, we here in the first couple of classes. So we, I mean, in the first couple of classes of Revelation. Revelation. Yeah, we, you know that's that's what we talked about. That and you know we see all the church. We see the church. The three chapters talking about the church, the church, the church, the church, and then we see the scene in heaven in chapter four, and then God says to John, "Come up here," and God and so John gets caught up into heaven. So we see sort of a a picture, a demonstration of the rapture happening. And then the church is never mentioned again by that name. You know, the, the, the term church or anything that resembles the church is never mentioned again um, in the rest of the book of Revelation. So there's an understanding, again, this is where we get the belief that the, that the rapture will happen before the tribulation. Um, and that everything that we see from chapter 4 on in Revelation is the tribulation. Is the seven-year period. So that's when this, that's when all this is going to be happening. That's why it, it really, you know, we're not really going to know. He is the is the Antichrist alive today? Could be, could very well be. We're not going to know who he is. We're not going to know him as that because we'll be gone by that. He won't because he will come to power, like we said in the first class in Revelation. He will come to power, or he will be recognized as a world leader when he makes a covenant. With Israel. Uh, Miss Lord, I think, said one time, because no man knows the day or the hour, there always has to be a potential Antichrist in the wings. It could have been Hitler if it had happened at that time, because Satan doesn't know when the rapture is going to happen, yeah. but he's always got to have someone waiting that that yeah, yeah, that, 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 could be, that could be his So that when sure. it happens, he can just fall alone. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. All right, so... So then we are, where are we now? Let's see if we can wrap this up. It's going to wrap up pretty, pretty quick. In chapter 14, uh, starting in verse 14, the reaping of the earth's harvest. Again, we're, getting, we're, at the end of the, we're at the end of the tribulation now. And this is, you know, again, part of why we know that this is in the, in the tribulation, because this is getting toward the end of the tribulation, as, as, as we're looking at some of these instances, you know, that it's, it's old, that the, you know, the... We've got two, two angels with a sickle. I mean, one is actually, appears to be uh, Jesus. One like the Son of Man having in his head a golden crown and a sharp sickle. And the angel says, thrust your sickle and reap. And then, he, then there's another angel that has a sickle. And uh, thrust your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine. You know, this is the end of the age. This is where he's gathering all the people on earth final half harvest, and this is where it talks about the splattering of the blood up to the horse's uh, bridle, okay, and I know there's lots of speculation as to what is that talking about, it very well could be talking about the battle of Megiddo, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, briefly, um, but the image of the, the blood to the horse's bridle, I actually did the calculations, okay, believe it or not, 1,600 furlongs is 200 miles, 200 miles long, and let's just assume that it's 200 miles wide, you know, just just for the sake of, because why would it, you know, why would it say 200 miles long if it's not 
sort of a, you know, it didn't say square miles, it just said for the length of 1,600 furlongs, so let's just assume that it's a square, it's a, it's a, 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 a symmetrical shape that we're looking at here. 200 mile by 200 miles, let's say five feet deep, the, bride, the horse's bridle, we'll call that five feet, okay, probably a little more than five feet, but let's just say if it was five feet. That is, I believe the number I came up with was something like 45 billion gallons of blood. Which, if you squeezed every drop of blood out of 2 billion people, that's what you'd get. Okay? Um, that's a lot of blood. It's not likely that it means that the blood is going to be that deep. It just means that the, it's going to be such bad bloodshed that there's just going to be blood everywhere. The blood's even going to be in the horse's bridle. It's going to be spattering up that high. It's just going to be a brutal devastation. Um, that violent of an interaction going on. That's probably not going to be a, a battlefield, a complete valley filled with blood up to five feet. That's just unlikely because at this point, don't forget, half the earth is dead. Half the earth has been <laughs> has been wiped out, you know. Uh, and that's just by the plague. That's not, to, that's not to mention all the people that have died by natural causes or died by, by persecution and all that kind of stuff. You know, um, so I don't even, you know, there's probably only about 2 billion people left on the earth at this point. And if you squeezed every drop of blood out of every single one of them, you'd have enough, enough blood to fill, the, to fill a valley from. So, um, but it's just saying, again, we're at the end of the, we're at the end of the days here and it's just going to get brutally violent. You know, it talks about the wine press was trampled outside the city and the blood came up to the wine press, up to the horses' bridles. So you think about a wine press, you know, and, the, and one of the words for right here, that last word for right, is something that says to the point. It's right at that point when the, it's about to burst. So you imagine, you know, you think of a wine press where there's stomp of the grapes and it's just spattering out. And it's so, the things are so juicy that it's just spattering out. And that's sort of the, the image it's trying to paint here. So then uh, 15 and 16, we're going to take together. 15 is the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation. It's only eight verses. And it's basically just a prelude, preparation for the bold judgments. Um, the, um, the seven angels with the seven final plagues. The last plague. We're nearing the end now. We see a sea of glass before the throne, which is an interesting thing because you know, the temple, the tabernacle that was built on earth was meant to be a reflection of the temple in heaven. And the tabernacle on earth had the laver out in front of the sanctuary, you know, like a sea of glass. And, and so we see this, this image of the sanctuary in heaven before the throne, before the sanctuary, is the sea of glass. Um, and um, the saints standing on the sea in victory. The martyr, these are the ones martyred in the tribulation. And they're singing a song. Uh, it's interesting, a song. Now, some say it's two songs. It's a song of Moses and a song of the Lamb. It could be one song, and it's called the Song of Moses and the Lamb, which encompasses the Old Testament and the New Testament. So you've got Moses and you've got Jesus Christ, the two biggest figures in the two Testaments. Um, and then again, you've got the, the, the temple uh, in heaven being opened up and the smoke coming out. And the seven angels proceeding directly from the presence of God. And this is an interesting thought. That they're not just sort of coming from this very specific. That they are coming out of the Holy of Holies. They're coming out of the presence of God. And being sent by God. And then, um, then we have the seven bowls. And this, again, we're just, this is going to be, we're just closing up now. It's going to be about five minutes. Uh, because this just goes like this. These seven bowls, and, and the King James calls them vials, and it, I think it's just a language thing in the English language because when I think of a vial, I think of, or I think of it like a test tube. I think of something tall and narrow, a vial where something is going to drip out. You know, this is a bowl. This is this word. We they use the word vial because we get the word vial. In Greek, it's the word fiale, which we get the word vial from. But a fiale in the Greek is a very shallow, wide vessel. So a bowl, or maybe a deep saucer, something like that. Um, because the image is this. When you 
spill a vial, a drop comes out. When you spill a bowl, the whole thing comes out. Bowls, when you pour a bowl, it's, it just it pours out. And this is the pouring out of God's wrath. Okay? Um, again, this is, in all actuality, in all likelihood, the last, seven, uh, last three and a half years. Uh, first bowl, we see sores. People, those who have the mark are going to break out in sores. Um, second is now the seas, which, are, you know, a third of them has already been destroyed. Now the rest of them, now it's all gone. Now the sea is going to be dead. Every living creature in the sea is going to be killed. It's going to be said it's going to be turned to blood, um, like the blood of a dead corpse. What an image that is, huh? Uh, and then the same thing is going to happen in the third seal to all the fresh water. Remember, it happened before. Hit the, hit the seas first, then hit the fresh water. Uh, so now the earth is without any water. So how much longer are we going to last without be drinking water, without any water at all? Uh, and then the fourth seal is, I mean, the fourth bowl is we have the sun scorching, uh, increasing intensity. And it's interesting, it says after, afterwards, after they, they're being burned by the sun, they still won't repent. Then we have darkness, and they curse God because of the darkness. You know, um, one of the things that, that um, David um, Guzik said is that, you know what, it's, it's the goodness of God that leads us to, to repentance. It's not his wrath. His wrath is not designed to lead us to repentance. His judgment doesn't lead us to repentance. It's his grace that leads us to repentance. So all these judgments and all this, this wrath being poured out, it only, like we talked about last week, hey, let's go, where's Corey? We talked about last week about the same sun that hardens clay, softens wax. This only hardens them more. The, the, the judgment of God doesn't soften them. It doesn't make them repentant. It doesn't make them sorry for what they do. They just, they, they, it only hardens them even more. Um, um, Spurgeon talks about how real repentance gives glory to God, even though he is condemning them. You know, a, a fake repentance, a um, carnal repentance is, you know, what we see in, in criminals who get caught. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But there's no genuineness. They're not, when they're before the judge, they're not giving homage and, and glory or, or respect to the judge and saying, you know what, good for you. <laughs> you sentence you to life in prison. Good job. You know, he's not saying that. That's not, that's, you know, carnal repentance. Now I'm going to be angry at the judge for giving me what I deserve. Right? The true repentance says, if he gives me what I deserve, I still give him glory. Because he's right. The judge of earth shall always do right. So then we have the sixth um, bowl is poured out and the Euphrates dries up. And then we've got one of the strangest images, which is the three frogs, which apparently are three demons that, that come out. And um, they dry up the Euphrates. And, and basically it's preparation for destruction. Uh, so that so that these armies from the east can come over, and we and they are gathered against God in Zechariah 14. I just want to turn there real quick. In Zechariah, I'll take a look here so you can see where Megiddo is. You know, people say, "Oh, well, look at where Armageddon is." It's really not that hard. I mean, R in the in the Hebrew because it says in the Hebrew it's Armageddon. Har means mountain. Har Megiddo means the mountain of Megiddo. So it's you know. People have speculated for centuries. I wonder where this is. It's right here. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's right, it's right there. And there's a picture of it. This is called um, Town Megiddo, which means the same thing, the mound, the hill of Megiddo. This is the valley of Megiddo. And this is a little mound. There's actually the city of Megiddo is down like over here. There's a, there's a modern city called Megiddo. But this is called uh, Town Megiddo, which is like a mound of Megiddo, and there's an ancient Assyrian city that was here, uh, but that's the valley. And, you know, apparently they're going to be coming down, coming through from the east, uh, and heading for Jerusalem, and somewhere around here, they're going to be, they're coming after the Jews, they're coming after Israel, but somewhere around here, all these armies, which could be that, that 200 million army, 
decide to turn their guns on Jesus because at that point Jesus is returning. Because Jesus is coming back and he's going to land on the Mount of Olives. And we'll look at, again, we'll look at Zechariah chapter 14. And behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split into two, from east to west, making a very large valley. And so he is on his way to the Mount of Olives, and he meets up with these, these characters who decide that Jesus is something they want to shoot at. Um, and I can, I can imagine that Jesus makes pretty short work of them. Uh, this has been the place site of over 200 battles through history. It's just, it's a very strategic point uh, on, like, on the way to Egypt, and there's, like, major highways, major roadways that go through here, and so it's a very strategic point. Um, and then the last thing we see in verse, in um, chapter 16, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from heaven, from the throne, saying, It is done. And this is it. This is, you know, we're going to pick up in 17 next week, 17 and 18. Um, but this is another one of those parentheses, because this is the end of it. This, it is done. This is the, the last, you know, um, when, when you, if you go on and you read in Zechariah, um, in verse, in verse 4, it talks about the nations falling. It talks about the splitting, like we talked about, and great earthquakes. Well, this is what it says. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake that has not occurred since the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts. The cities of all nations fell. You see that same thing in Zechariah with the return of Christ. He sets foot on the Mount of Olives, and the ground splits. The city is broken. And earthquakes break out. So this is this is this is the the, the triumphant reentry, if you will, of Jesus Christ on the earth. And then this will continue into when we pick up in chapter 19, it picks up from here. But 17 and 18 will sort of um, take a break and, and take a little parentheses for a couple chapters and then pick up where we left off. But um, and then it talks about a talent. Uh, hail, the size of the, the weight of the talent. Talent was was considered a man's a man's weight in gold. A talent of gold was like a man's weight. So um, it's estimated somewhere around. Remember, they were smaller back then, uh, between 120 and 130 pounds. Um, one hailstone between 120 and 130 pounds. That's a big hailstone. And the sad epitaph. In verse 21, is men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. You know, we're back to that same mindset where rather than repenting, rather than turning, they're just gonna they're gonna shake their fist at God. You know, and even with all that judgment, they're um, they're still gonna feel like they're being treated poorly. Um, it's gonna be a very difficult time to live in. I'm glad I'm not going to be there. Do we have any questions, comments? Uh, God's purpose is grace, really, and not that. The suggestion might be that even up to the last minute, some can be saved. Yeah, up to the last minute, anybody can be saved. And we're going to see that God, God's still not done with his redemptive work. That he's still going to, you know, after the, at the end of the, the, uh, the thousand year reign, he's still going to give people an opportunity. To turn to him. They still have free will and they, they're going to rebel against him but because, you know, the, the way I put it is so long as there is somebody who will be born who will receive him, he will continue. 
when God is convinced that there's nobody left, then, then he's done. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um, I don't think that there's going to be any um, surprises in heaven to the degree of, well, they got in because they were close enough. They were, they were a really good person, or, you know, they were sorry for the things that they did. They didn't receive Christ, but they were really sorry. That's not going to happen. I mean, you know, there's, there's only one way to heaven. There's only, there's only ever been one way to heaven. And that's through the grace of God and through faith. So uh, I think that's going to be, you know, he's always going to be, he's, he's long-suffering. He gives every opportunity for people to repent. Is it? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your uh, for your grace and your mercy and for your long suffering and for your um, your patience with us for not giving us what we deserve. And Father, we, we pray for those that will be enduring these things that they would soften their hearts and that they would come to you in their day of repentance and that they would be saved and not spend eternity where the worm dieth not. So bless us now as we go. Uh, keep us safe on the road. And uh, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.